Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Today we have Derek Yamashita with us, and we are talking about the hidden Japan and his love and passion for bringing people to Yamagata and all the wonderful things that you can do there. So, we're going to have a lot of great travel stories. Stick around, we will be right back. Thanks for joining. I'm JJ Walsh. I run a small business called the Inbound Ambassador and do a talk show series live streamed every weekday from Japan called Seeking Sustainability Live. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm JJ Walsh, and today we have Derek Yamashita with us. Thanks for joining, Derek. I joined. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? <laughs> now, <laughs> how's the weather there in Yamagata? Uh, it's kind of like icy, icy rain right now, and snow is about to fall. You know, we got a lot of snowfall here in Yamagata. Pretty yeah, cool. we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna show some some photos. And I talked to uh, Jess Hallams uh, last week about Tohoku travel, and you guys are kind of in the same area. So some of the things that we'll talk about with you, maybe we introduced with her as well. But it's great if you guys can collaborate and work together in the same region, right? Yeah, neighboring prefectures. About two and a half hours by car. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're on separate sides of the coast. She's on the Pacific Ocean side. We're on the uh, uh, Japan Sea side. Nice. It's I, I like her idea and I, I think it'd be great for your business as well to have like a, a branding of that area because like you say on your website, less than 1% of visitors come to the Yamagata or Tohoku Miyagi. That yeah. whole area gets the so entire, few the visitors. The entire region, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, but it has so much to offer. So hopefully we can introduce some appeal today thanks to your wonderful website. Well, thank you. <laughs> I was actually a photographer before I started up this company. Oh, so nice. all the yeah. we, do, we have lots of uh, photos and video of the region. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. That really helps in terms of travel appeal. Having high quality photos and video is a huge, huge way. And of course, a nice, nicely designed website, a huge way to bring people to the area. I can't talk enough about the importance of social media and you guys have done such a beautiful job on your Instagram and, and Twitter and website as well. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So could you tell us a little bit how you got started? Like how did you find yourself in Yamagata? So uh, I think like a lot of foreigners who live in the countryside, I first came to Japan on jet and you know through the jet program we can't really select where we go. so. Um, I mean, I, I did say I wanted to be in, I wanted to be in Tohoku because um, after the uh, tsunami hit, I went to volunteer in uh, like Ishinomaki a couple times. I really liked the people there. But I thought Tohoku was just that one single region. But I didn't know Tohoku was, you know, such a vast, vast, huge region. So there's, oh, you want to go to Tohoku? Well, we'll put you in Yamagata. But I'll be honest, um, when I first got placed in uh, Tohoku, when I first got placed in Yamagata, I, uh, I really, I really, really did not want to be there because I really wanted to be in either Ishinomaki or Tokyo or Kyoto. But um, you know, after I was there for a couple months, made friends, and you know, they showed me the local places, they showed me the local restaurants. I got to be, make friends with people. You know, I realized it was that place was really right for me because I'm a really outdoor kind of person. I love fishing, hiking, cycling. You know, I love, you know, I love really rural experiences, hands-on food experiences. So, yeah, I mean, I did, I didn't start my travel company up right away. I did Jet for a year. And then after that, for about a year and a half, I worked in a, you know, large Japanese company as a photographer for their uh, products. And that company also owned the Micro Tea House. It's um, called Somato, Somato Micro Tea House in Sakata City. And so they got some international tourists, lots of agents that send their people there. So that's how I first got involved with uh, travel. I started working with those agents, working with customers. And I eventually started planning entire trips for tour agents. Tour agents were saying, hey, you know, we want to go to Samano. Where should we stay? What should we do? And I made like week-long itineraries for them. And then I started talking to the customers and then they said, oh, yeah, yeah, our, our agent planned a wonderful trip. I'm like, oh, I, I planned that. And they're like, really? And I realized, hmm, well, I like that. I like doing that. I like going the region, so maybe I'll do that. But then I, I had some Japanese friends I knew who, you know, they're freelance writers. Uh, they do websites, so we got together and we said, you know, well, we want to promote this region. You know, let's start up a website. We started up the Hidden Japan, and then eventually that website got bigger and bigger, and we got contact by agents, and then we decided to make a company. That was about three years ago. 
Wow, awesome. People think of Japan, they definitely think of bullet trains. You know, Shinkansen, they really they think of the country as a train country. But when you want to get around, like the northern area, like Hokkaido, and also many regions in Tohoku, if you stick to the,、uh, the Shinkansen lines, the bullet train lines, you're going to be really, really limited on where you can go because it's a very mountainous region, a very rural region. And they can't really afford to maintain expensive lines like that. So, what I encourage people to do is if you're going to spend time in the countryside a lot, I'd say just fly directly there because it's cheaper than the bullet train, even if you buy a JR Pass, and you can get there within an hour. You get to my region from Tokyo in about you know, 48 minutes, 50 minutes.、Wow. But if you take a train, You know, you have, to, you have to go up to Niigata and you have to go up along the coast by another train that takes four and a half hours. Oh, wow, yeah. So, well, the reason why I made those three、uh, categories is just because I, I wanted to separate, I, I wanted to kind of categorize all the, all the stuff, all the, all the things that, that, this, that this region has. So,、um, when you think of like outdoors, I think if you want outdoor adventures, Tohoku is really incredible for that. We have, we have amazing trails. Like, One of the reasons why I like living here in Yamagata is because I could do a waterfall hike. I could do, a,、um, I could do like an eight hour round trip hike, you know, just by driving 30 minutes from my front door. So we got really vast nature, you know, really, really beautiful nature.、Um, lots of waterfalls, lots of mountains, you know, beautiful coastline to explore. And、um, in the leisure area,、uh, we have a lot, I, I introduced a lot of cultural spots like Sawana Maiko Tea House. Like the, the temples here, where you can do Zaz,、uh, Zen meditation or do TC ceremonies. And then for festivals and events, I think that's one of the real appeals of the countryside. If you can come here during the summer season or throughout the year, if you can come here when these festivals take place, you, know, you can really experience these regions like a local person. Especially here in Yamagata, when you're at these local festivals, you'll probably be the only foreigner there. And everyone else there is going to be local. So it'll be really fun. Though, people will come and talk to you, there's a whole lot to see. Nice. Yeah, I'm showing pictures right now from your website of the waterfalls. So you have Mount Chokai, which you've got some great walking, hiking, and also an amazing looking waterfall.、Mm-hmm. That might.、Um, so, yeah, Mount Chokai, it has, well, it has hundreds and hundreds of waterfalls. And some of the famous、wow. ones are Thomas Dade, and it has、uh, Ichinotaki, Ninotaki, Sanotaki Falls. And what's really interesting is that you know, during the summer, of course, there are really magnificent waterfalls you know, surrounded by really, really lush green. But、um, if you go during、uh, late January to mid February, those waterfalls will all freeze. They'll, they'll become frozen solid and they'll take on a really deep blue color. Wow. So you, you, have to, you slap on some snowshoes and you know, you, to get to them, you know, when, you go, when you go there by car in the summer, it's like a 10 minute walk to get up to the waterfall. But, During the winter, the roads don't go up there, so you have to take、like、a two hour hike to get there. But it's so worth it. It's so worth it. <laughs> wow, that sounds amazing. So, snowshoeing in winter and then seeing the waterfalls, and then you could have an amazing onsen at the end, right? That's what we do. Do a four hour round trip hike, get really freezing cold, but then show up in the onsen bath. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. Um, so, on your website, you talk about Ginzan Onsen. That looks amazing.、Mm-hmm. I think, well, I would have to say that, well, Ginzan Onsen, it's, it was definitely a very much a hidden gem, but its popularity is like, skyrocketing every single year. And it's already come to the point where if you want to get a reservation, you have to make at least one year in advance. But it's,、oh, it's wow. because it's,、uh, it's like, really deep in the mountains, in like, a small valley in between the mountains. And, It's just a beautiful line in these onsen towns along a small river. And a lot of people comment that it looks just like a Studio Ghibli film, Spirit in the Way. It's, my, it's my single, probably my single most、uh, favorite view in Japan, actually, during the winter when you get that scene. And if you, go there in, if, you go, if you can go there in the winter, I really, really recommend it. You know, go there right at sunset, just check out that view. Wow. It'll be worth it.、Cool. <laughs> and then you've also got Zhao Hot Springs. So Zhao is famous for the snow monsters. Yeah, Mount Zhao is pretty interesting because you've got really high winds coming up,、um, what is it, the southern side of the mountain, s- southeast side of the mountain. And it's just like the pine trees are on the mountain, they just get like pelted and pelted and they build up ice and snow to the point where they get like 10 times their original size. And they look like these massive snow monsters on the mountain. I love that. And so you could, go, you could go up by a cable car, walk around the trees, and it's pretty, it's pretty cool because it, you know, it's, like, it's like a two story building. With like a giant ice sculptures, and there's thousands of them. It looks amazing. 
So all of these <laughs> things that we're talking about, um, you guys can help people find a way there, uh, a place to stay, a place to eat. That's that's what you guys are doing is being the connector between the visitor and the locals, right? Yeah, uh, we start we started our company. Sorry, it's, it's raining. I'm gonna take a quick walk downstairs, but I'll keep you on. Okay. But, um, yeah, we we started our company as just a website originally. So we're just we're just a travel resource. You know, I, basically when I came to Yamagata, um, I had a really hard time here because I couldn't find out what this place had. I, I didn't know, I didn't know how to get around. So I initially wanted to make this site, thehindjapan.com, as a resource for visitors like me who really needed that information. But then um, we got more and more contact from tour agents and people who wanted to plan our trips. So uh, just last year, we successfully got our tour license. So now uh, what we're doing is we we take, you know, customers contact us and they say, you know, we want to spend four or five days in the countryside. Um, or they say, you know, we want to spend a week. Some people say they want to spend two weeks. And then I, I, just, I basically just uh, take in their questions, to, uh, ask them questions, and then I make custom plans for them so they can enjoy their trips here. That's awesome. Uh, we have a comment from Elizabeth Ann. Thanks for joining Elizabeth from Facebook. She says, the Hidden Japan has some super awesome experiences. They are truly unforgettable. Their connection with locals in the region are pretty remarkable and totally make them outstanding. Some of my most memorable experiences in Japan are through them. Even for a local who has lived here 23 years, they really impressed me. Highly recommended. Wow, great recommendation. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> Uh, she That's was, awesome. um, I, she, I was with her in Yamagata uh, last week. We spent about four days going around Yamagata. A lot of fun. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, really fun. Um, okay, so let's go back to your website. Now, it's not only outdoor experiences. Um, you also offer like really interesting and unique experience such as I love your YouTube video when you're harvesting mountain vegetables with Chef Ito. Can you tell us mm -hmm. about that? Yeah, so like, you know, we, we also, we make a guide for the region, but we also, um, you know, I've lived, we lived here for five years. We're all our, all our members in Japan are local to the area. So we use our personal connections with the chefs, with the factories. And, you know, we talk to them and say, you know, you know, we, everyone here, everyone here wants to welcome inbound tour, international tourists. And they come up to us and say, oh, well, what, what can we do? So uh, if you're, if you're seeing the pictures of Chef Ito, I talk with him and, you know, he's, um, He's a, he's, in a bril he's a brilliant uh, shoujin yodi chef. Shoujin yodi is, is a, a all vegetarian type of cuisine, a very religious cuisine. Um, and he's on uh, what he does. We talked to a shoujin yodi chef from Kyoto the other day, and mm. uh, he told us all about it's not just about the the taste of the food. It's about the experience. It's about the aromas and uh, picking your own vegetables and then using that in shoujin yori where the vegetable is king right because it's all plant-based it's all vegan that would be a great experience and it, i love the part where uh he's asking you to choose what you think is edible and of course you don't know i wouldn't know either and then you point at something he's like no that's just a leaf yeah <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was happens, great. It happens to me a lot. <laughs> but like you said, just, um, in particular, one thing about the uh, shoujin yori on that mountain, on the Dewa Sanso Mountains, is it's different from all the other shoujin yori in Japan because it's uh, shoujin yori built around the Yamurishi mountain monks who would spend months in the mountains. And so, because they'd be isolated in the mountains from the rest of society, they they had to find a way to sustain themselves. And so, they lived off the wild mountain vegetables. And so the shoujin yori there, it's, it has a unique emphasis on uh, the, the sunside, the mountain vegetables. So really very much harvesting it yourself and learning how to cook it. It's, there's something different about it when you, when you take it by your hand. And I really like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, Bern Shellhorn, who told us uh, as a shoujin yori chef, he told us about making it. And he said, it's not only about the vegetable, how does it taste? It's about the vegetable on that day that you're tasting. So it's, it's all about mindfulness and appreciating nature as it changes over time or as it changes by season. And I thought that was really, really cool. Um, so you're, you were picking uh, aomizu 
and wild parsley and things that I would never have expected. But also um, you were picking bamboo. It looks like bamboo is kind of difficult to get out of the ground. Is that right? It is. It's like it's kind of in a rocky area. So it, you, have to, you have to hit at just the right angle to, uh, really, to really get it in and get it through. And, and what the hardest part was not extracting, it was getting to the area where it was because it's actually kind of dangerous because you have like the small bamboo and you have to hold it back. And as you're walking through the forest, if you're not careful, you know, if you, if you let the branch swing out, it might whack the person behind you. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, easy to get lost in this forest, but yeah. really, really interesting. That's why, that that's, why we, that's why we went with a guide. Uh, yeah. That's what we want to show you <laughs> I mean, when people, you know, like now with the in the age of the internet, people are always asking me, um, isn't it fine just to come to Japan and explore on your own because you've got so much great information online? Well, you can, but you're still really missing that link to local people. And mm -hmm. the real experiences, you really need somebody to introduce you to the best places. It's, it's not, and, and don't you agree as a guide that you really, there still really is a role for guides in Japan? Yeah, because I mean, I think I do a lot of guiding myself and the guides that we hire are all local. And, you know, in the most basic sense, the guides will just look at you from point A to point B on time, point A to point B to B to point C on time in a timely manner. But, you know, the, the good point about having a guide here in Yamagata, especially a local guide, is that you know they live in the region they know they're connected with everyone around you so when our guides show up to places the locals know them by first name and they chat and because of that they can really bring out you know if they're with, if they're with customers you know if you're with, if you're just travelers going to a you know a shoyu factory or chef Ito for the first time you're, meet, you're meeting them for the first time so it's not that you know it's still first time meeting but if you have a local guy who's already their friend, you know, you really bring out some really warm conversations. You're like, okay, you know, they're friends. So these are my customers. And if you get introduced to a friend, you know, you get a much more, you know, really, really more personal experience. And the guides also can tell their personal stories about, you know, why they chose to live here, why they continue to live here, and what they love about the region. So I think, um, you know, more so than the local, more so than thinking them as a guide, it's kind of like you come to this, you know, really rural region of Japan and. It's like you're, guide, you're being guided around by your high school friend or your college, your college mate. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do some guide training um, for Japanese guides who want to uh, tour or guide around international visitors. And I always tell them it's all about, for international visitors, it's all about personalization and exactly what you were talking about. You know something about your guest. You know a lot about your local chef or whoever that you're taking them to the experience. So you're able to make connections between the visitor's experience or life wherever they're from and the local insider information that they would never have found out without you. And that mm -hmm. making those connections, that is the story that travelers are going to tell when they go home, right? That is mm -hmm. the secret to good guiding. And I, I think that's a problem with a lot of Japanese guides is they have this idea that I have a lot of information. I'm the expert. I, I just want to tell like a teacher top down, yeah. right? Mm. And I always recommend that they listen more and they try to make every experience unique. And I, mm -hmm. I really appreciated that about your introduction of the French chef on your website and talking about how he's look, using local ingredients, but he's also listening to your story. And he actually created an original dish based on what you were going to do the next day, right? Mm -hmm. That's what he made on the fly. <laughs> Just based off, and while, while he was talking, he was actually making that, and she's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. And that's, that's the kind of personalization that people really, really value when they visit Japan. It, you know, there's a real high quality of experience for sure, every time. But when they have that personalization, that makes a big impression. And that's really difficult without a guide. So that's a wonderful service you're doing. Uh, thank you, thank you. Lauren, Lauren Shannon says, great live and I can't wait to come visit. Was very jealous of Anne's trip last week. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. <laughs> yeah, I so love all tell us, the tours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Tell us a little bit about um, the French chef that you introduce on your website. That's a great place. Yeah, Chef Yama, he's, uh, he's based in Yamagata City. He's, uh, well, he's interesting because for one, he, he is a very, very top level chef. He has respect amongst the Michelin star French chefs in Japan. Brilliant chef, brilliant plating. Uh, he uses traditional French uh, culinary arts and he combines it with local Yamagata seasonal ingredients as well as some imported French ingredients. And he really makes, it, his, his menus are all custom. They're always changing by the week and by the season. You know, small restaurant, really great food. But besides his food, besides his technical skills, as a person, he's like extremely fascinating because he's a huge, he's a massive bodybuilder, so he's like absolutely huge. And um, he also really loves he loves Yamagata too. So I met him um, at these uh, sometimes these culinary chefs from Europe would come over for cultural exchange, and he'd always be there to vol- as a volunteer to you know help teach them the Yamagata culinary techniques and. He could speak some English, he was talking with them. And he has a real passion for, you know, bringing international tourists to Yamagata, because Yamagata is not a tourist spot at all. It's not it's not on the map, so he wants to help do that. So, you know, the chef's like, he came up and talked to me. He says, you know, if I could do something, I want to do it. <laughs> so That's we recently awesome. did a Yamagata wine pairing dinner with him. And, you know, oh, we're doing great. Other stuff. Yeah. One, one thing in terms of sustainability that I love to see, um, because of course Yamagata, like many rural areas, is famous for its sake. And inside his cooking, he's using a byproduct of sake, the kasu, in some yeah. of his French dishes. And I thought that was really interesting. It's wonderful to see how businesses are being innovative about using what would normally be maybe food waste and mm-hmm. and reusing it in a high quality high value kind of way i love that mm-hmm. fantastic yeah and it's also with the uh, when we do our uh, uh, on my website we also have a we also work in, extensively with a very famous uh japanese chef named chef chef suda he does really good fish work and then when you see him uh, filleting the fish like when he's taken off the fillets you know the center bone there's almost no uh, meat left on it and then even with the bones and even with the fish head itself, he'll he'll cut it up and he'll he'll use it later for a soup or other uses. So really, when you think about, it, there's like there's like no food waste that comes from that fish at all. It's really remarkable. That's so important because there's too much food waste, especially around Japan. I think around the world it's a problem, but around Japan too. I notice you have a fugu demonstration. Is that with Chef Suda? That's with Chef Suda, yeah. <laughs> and uh, fugu, can you introduce to our listeners? Some of them might not be familiar with fugu. What's special about it? It's a fugu or, or pufferfish, you know, blowfish. It's actually the, um, especially the tiger pufferfish that's the most prized pufferfish in all of Japan. It's actually, it's actually one of the most deadly uh, food items in the world. Even like a small, if you eat this, like a small amount about this big of the wrong, wrong part of the fish, it's more than enough to kill you very, very fast. And one fugu, one fugu has enough poison to kill over 8,000 people with its tetratoxins. So it's crazy because if you think about fish, that's that incredibly dangerous where, you know, of a whole fugu, you only have small parts that are actually edible. It's mind boggling to think that people would actually want to eat them or even how they even figured out to eat them. But in the fugu experience, we start with a whole fugu. We start when it's already dead, so don't worry, you don't have to see it killed. <laughs> but, um, the, the chef will put, remove all the poisonous parts from the edible parts on two trays right in front of you and then you'll see like, you know, overwhelming majority of that fish is highly, highly toxic. And you get like a small, little, small, two small, very uh, small fillets from that whole entire fugu. And then from there, um, fugu has a very, very rough, kind of a rough texture to it, a very strong texture to its uh, sashimi. So he can cut it razor thin, like absolutely razor thin, and it's pure white meat. He plates it, he plates it in a beautiful uh, work of art. So it's really, it's, it's, it's really just an like absolute culinary art just to see the art of removing that poison and the art of plating such a prized ingredient because it's, it's, it's the most expensive fish, one of the most exp- expensive, expensive ingredients in the world, you know, fugu. Yeah. I, I heard a really funny story about uh, fugu fishermen. So uh, in Hiroshima, the uh, fisherman was telling me, oh, sometimes I'll catch the fugu and uh, I'll eat it. And I was like, oh, are you a chef? And he's like, oh, no, no, no. Sometimes my face gets numb and I have to go to hospital. But uh, yeah, I love it. And I was like, why? Why would you risk it? That's amazing. Have you ever, so, have you, have you ever had fugu? 
I did. Okay. When I, I'm a vegan in less 10 years, but when I first came to Japan, I did eat fish and I did try it. Um, I would never eat it if it wasn't a licensed chef. That's crazy. <laughs> actually, yeah, you, actually, I should point out that, yeah, you need, you need a special license to serve the fugu. And even once you get that license, you know, unless you have three or four years under your belt, customers will never eat your fugu. Yeah. Like a, once a chef gets it, then they need three or four years and more practice until they can actually serve it. And um, not, you know, people don't, you know, nowadays it's the procedures for treating people with that type of poisoning. As long as you can get to the hospital, they should be okay. But it makes your face, it, it starts from your mouth and makes it kind of tingly. And then it, because it, the tetratoxin, they disable your nervous system. So when you have tingling in your mouth, that's a very bad sign. I don't know if that person should be doing that. No, and then, <laughs> and then I was like, wait, how many times are we talking about this happening? Like surely after one time of that happening, you should stop and he's just living on the edge. That's his, uh, he feels excited about trying to cook it himself, I guess. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, Crazy. we'll cut it off here so it doesn't get too long, but some people at the food restaurants, they ask for that feeling. They like that sensation. <gasps> I, I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> Seriously? Wow. It's like a zazen when you can ask for the, the hit of the stick on your back. You want to ask for a little bit of death, death on your lips, huh? Ooh. Wow. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> living, living on the edge. So you also, um, some of the tours that you recommend are sea to table. So getting out with fishermen, catching the fish, preparing the fish. Um, that's great. I mean, in terms of like fishing commercially, like is it, it's very dubious whether it's sustainable or not. But when we're talking about coastal fishing, that's supporting local people and it, it's not on a commercial level or, you know, local level only. It's very it's more sustainable and it's so important. And it also reminds us why we need to use less plastic um, because it ends up in the oceans. Right. So. Is that a popular experience for your visitors, see the table? Well, it's one that we recently got up about a few months ago. Uh, but I'll, I'll point out that, you know, uh, the, fi the local fisheries here, you know, they're, they're, you got to remember that they're very, very small fishing villages. They're not, they're not anything like the commercial fishing things you see on, online or on YouTube. I mean, I went out with some fishermen at like from 10 o'clock to 3 a.m. in the morning. And... Um, we were catching Japanese sea bream. I have a video on my YouTube channel where you can see the entire process, but they lay out all these tiny hooks hanging in the, in the, in the ocean with uh, baited hooks to octopus. And out of five hours and catching maybe 120 fish, we only caught Japanese sea bream. We didn't catch any bycatch. And every single fish we caught in the ocean was the exact species that we wanted, the exact size that we wanted. And so we didn't kill a single fish that we didn't want to catch. So it's... I think they're, they, you know, the fishing practices, even though they're technically business commercial, the commercial fishermen here, they have great respect for the region. They're very careful, get careful to protect it. And you know, the, I think a lot of the traditional Japanese farming and you know, fishing and hunting techniques, they are in themselves very sustainable. Because I think they've continued, they, they've continued these practices for generations and centuries, so they've naturally had to be sustainable. So I think that's one thing that is really interesting. If you come out here to Yamagata, you'll see that these processes are. And they're sustainable. I think they're the way that we can learn a lot from the way they do things to make our practices sustainable as well. That's really important. And it's, it's so true what you say about going back to uh, upholding the old ways, the heritage style, the traditional ways. Um, in Jess Hallam's talk, she showed the oyster farms and they're going out and getting the oysters and having a roast up right there with the oyster farmers. And I was so happy to see the oyster farmers are not using plastic because in Hiroshima, the oyster farms use plastic separators and we do beach cleanups, pick it up thousands every time, you know? So these are modern techniques, which are maybe easier, but you are diminishing the value of experience, but also you're polluting the world. I know they found these plastic pipes in Hawaii, where I'm from, right? So. These are global issues that it's really important, even on the local level, to be really thinking about. And so I'm so happy to see you're only catching fish that you're going to use. Um, you're not using plastics. You know, these are all things, even if they are doing, you can just suggest it. These, this is the power of being a local guide, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, wonderful. 
Uh, Lauren has a big question for us. Question for you both. How do we get more first-time visitors to Japan to leave the Golden Route and head to Yamagata and other areas where there are so many great local and authentic experiences? Is it just marketing or do we need to do more as inbound ambassadors to help reduce logistical and other issues? Huge question, Lauren. That's a good question, Lauren. <laughs> And, and I don't think it, it, it's, it's the answer is both those questions. So give me a second to think about that. Well, uh, I mean, you did so a, all the, all a great you did a great article, Derek, about the impact that COVID is having on the Ryokans and the local inns. And and I think your your whole point was how do we support local businesses during coronavirus? And so it's like you've had so many less visitors than all over Japan for so long, but now coronavirus has had especially hard impact, right? Do you want to talk mm -hmm, about that mm -hmm. a little bit? Oh yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll answer you. I'll, I'll go with that question first. Um, yeah, I think one in my article on my website that I wrote about is just that, you know, so many of the, the gems, the Yamagata, they're, they're not anywhere near the train stations. They're in the mountains. They're along the coastline. You have these really you know, family, you know, family run with just like the parents and two kids running a nice Japanese inn, a charming Japanese inn deep in the mountains and the onsen town or on the coastline. And, you know, these places, these are family owned businesses where they're not making a whole lot of profit. You know, they're just getting by year to year. They depend on the yearly tourism seasons to get that profit they need to survive, really. And then COVID hits and then you wipe out uh, the Japanese tourists and then, um, all the hope that they had for international tours as well is gone for the foreseeable future. And you know, we've had probably does I've had we've had probably over eight or nine that I that I know of that shut down. And you know, I think these are the real gems of Yamagata. These are the real gems of the Japanese countryside. It's, it's why you come out because you know what? If if we lose these family-owned businesses, then all we have left are like the commercial Japanese uh, business hotels around the station. And you know, if you're going to stay in a you know a modern hotel. You, know, you could just stay in Tokyo or Kyoto, Osaka, and you get a lot better modern hotels. But uh, for me, my concern is that we're losing these local uh, hotels. We're look at, look at losing these local restaurants, and, and if we continue to lose them, you know, then we lose the reason why people should come to Yamagata. So I've been really concerned about that. Um, I'll talk I, a little bit about Lauren's question as well. Lauren's very big question. Yeah, <laughs> that's, I, uh, that's definitely I the, agree, hundred percent. Yeah. It's, it's creating appeal and maintaining these places, which will have lasting appeal, right? If, if, like you say, you are only left with business hotels around the station or Western hotels around Yamagata, you're going to diminish the appeal of the whole area. So it's not just about one yokan. It's about mm -hmm. maintaining, <coughs> maintaining heritage, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Go ahead. It's just, it's, just, it's just a part of the entire appeal. But, um, you know, Lauren's question about how do we get people out to rural regions, that is the biggest struggle for our company. Uh, for example, I, you know, some of my, our Facebook posts, sometimes they go viral. We, I posted pictures of the Sakura spots around Yamagata. I told people about how, you know, you know, you can, you can enjoy some of the beautiful Sakura spots in Japan. And if you go on a weekday, you'll be the only one in the entire park. You can, you can enjoy Sakura without any crowds, like in Tokyo. I mean, gosh, the, the popular talk, the Sakura spots in the, in the big cities, you, know, you can barely move, you can barely turn your shoulders because you've got people here and here. But, you know, out in the countryside, you could just have a picnic and just hear the birds and water and no people sounds. And so I posted about that and we got like, 3,000 comments on it and people kept messaging us and they said, oh, I'm, I'm in Japan right now. Uh, you said they're in bloom right now. Uh, I want to go. And then like, all right, well, here's the address and here's the station you can go to. And then this, and then they said, okay, how, how, so it's an hour from Tokyo? And I said, well, no, it's by bullet train. It's uh, four and a half hours. And then most people, most people, they wouldn't even answer me after I said that. Or some people just say, oh, sorry, not this time yet. So, you know, there's so much appeal here in the, in the Japanese country, in Yamagata, but because of the distance involved with getting here, or with a commitment, or people, they tend to be so afraid of flying for whatever reason, you really shouldn't be afraid of flying. But, you know, it, it takes more effort to get out here. It's a lot, it's a very far excursion off the golden route. But in order to get people here then, we have to, like, we can't just try to pull them in with just one thing, like, okay, just come see the Sakura. You have to build a, at least a three or four day 
reason, a, a very a very packed, very very appealing three or four day package or itinerary for them, for them to justify making that journey off the golden rail. Um, in in a very in a nutshell, I think that's how I would answer that question. Absolutely, it's it's about longer travel. It's about slow travel. It's about having、uh, more meaningful travel, which this is in terms of sustainable tourism. This is what we've been talking about for years, and、uh, until now,、uh, the way travel focus has been in Japan has not been ab- about sustainability. It's about numbers. And we saw problems develop from the go-to campaign because the idea was about numbers. How many people can we pack into this plan or this hotel or this destination? Whereas we need to think about spacing people out, especially now after coronavirus.、Yeah. Spacing people out, rural travel, longer stays, more meaningful travel. It's going to cost more, but you're going to be able to look back on it like such a valuable memory of your life and get back to what is the real reason people want to travel. They don't want to travel and check off a list of I took that photo. Maybe for now they think they do, but in terms of your life. And looking back on experiences, you know, meaningful travel where you stay somewhere and meet the local people, and really see and experience interesting things—that's the true meaning of travel, right? That's definitely, that's definitely right. And as you said earlier, you were talking about earlier. I think the thing that you're going to be telling, you're going to go home and talk to your friends about, is not saying, "Oh, I saw a beautiful waterfall." It's going to be, it's going to be talking about the guide you're with or that small farmer's restaurant you went with in. You know, nearby the waterfall, the village, and you met the old couple that ran it, that brought out tea and snacks and talked with you. It's it's about it's it, you know the, the things that's going to stick with you, things that you're really going to remember, is the, are the people and the friends you make here. Like a lot of my、uh, customers, they became personal Facebook friends with some of our Japanese chefs or、uh, you know mountain guides, and <laughs> I see them、uh, commenting in English and Japanese, and they're using Google Translate to talk to each other still, even a year and a half, two years after. I like、oh, that too.、Wow. I'm happier. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Definitely, that's that's what we should be aiming for, and then we should be encouraging、uh, local DMOs, destination management companies,、uh, local government, national tourism agencies. We should be soft pushing them and making suggestions that this is the way to go. That we have to. Think of not only the visitor, but we have to think of what's good for the resident and what do the residents want. And we have to talk to local businesses, not make a national policy because area by area is so unique and so different in what the locals need in terms of support. I found that in so many areas. I'm sure you see that all the time in your area. Yeah, especially for our region, you know, even from city to city, from village to village, and town to town,、uh, the logistical capabilities of how many customers they can take is it, it varies wildly. Like for example, I I have a we have a very good program coming up in a small sake town called Oyama here in the Shonai region, and there's the only lodging that currently exists there for visitors is only a one is one venue that can hold four people. So、we can only take four people at a time if we want to do lodging in the area, but you know. It, but the appeal of the area is incredible. You stay at this, you stay at this kitchen, this a、uh, this a、uh, beautifully redesigned Japanese home, and you go around to local factories, farmers. You get ingredients along your way, and you meet back at night at that kitchen area. And the farmers and the sake factory people, they come with you to that. That they come meet you for dinner. And you cook a local meal together with everyone in this big, in this, this nice kitchen. And at one table, you have dinner together with the local people. So I think you know, even though that place can't accommodate a whole lot of people, it's truly special. Yeah. And it's it's going to cost more. I think people just have to get the idea that they're going to have to invest more money in their travel. I think gone are the days when you can just come and travel around and just see things for an hour in one place and get on a train. I mean, you can, but、yeah. you know, I wouldn't recommend it. I've never <laughs> never recommended that.、Um, why, right? But because it's going to be so much more expensive to fly internationally. Um, prices of quality, good value places are going to have to go up. I think we need to brace ourselves for prices going up a bit, right? 
Yeah. And, you know, and we, our company, we, you know, if we want to focus purely on profits, you know, we just go for bus tours, but we, we will not touch bus tours. We, 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 won't really, we don't really work with groups larger than eight even, just because it's hard to do those personal experiences. But you're exactly right. You know, you, you, you pay a bit more because, of course, you, you have smaller numbers and you, you have to hire a guide and make arrangements. But what you get from that, you get so much more. You get, yeah. such, a, you get such more stronger memories. Absolutely. I let's talk about wasabi. I love your wasabi experience. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Can you can you tell us about picking wasabi and making wasabi? What a great video on YouTube. I love that. Sorry, Joe. You you broke up. You, you, okay. You broke up this area. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm I'm showing pictures from your excellent wasabi video. Can you tell us about that experience? Oh yeah, the wasabi. That's really really good. It's um. It's, it's also, if you look at the first intro scene for that, it's super deep in the mountains in like a small village called Tozawa. And you know, it's like, you're, uh, you're, about, like a, you're about like 30 or 40 minutes through the mountains to any, any of the nearest like city or town. And um, you know, it's like, it's like really deep in the mountains and small valleys, you got this uh, farming village and there's a wasabi farmer there who, uh, you know, he, if you know anything, if you know about wasabi, you know it can only be grown in very, very specific spots, like with natural spring water. So he found this, he found a specific spot where he can grow them. And for like, like 20 years, he was doing trial and error, trying to figure out how to grow it. Anyways, you know, we can go, you can go into their farm itself and you can pick the wasabi yourself. And then you could um, go back to his, you know, his house, his factory, where he processes it and he shows you how to process it, taste it in all different ways. and. You know, what we're talking with him about is, you know, maybe we'll harvest it there, then we'll take it to the coast and then do a sushi or a fish, combine it with a fish experience as well. It's, it's, really, it's really interesting to be able to gather yourself and then eat the leaves and learn all about the wasabi. Yeah, I love that uh, when you're in his farm and he's talking about, like you said, about trial and error and losing 50% of the crop because the temperature changes are really important for wasabi. And then he told you to eat the leaf and you could taste the wasabi even in the leaf. And then the intensity of the spice over time. It's really interesting. Uh, it, it, it was, it's shocking how much of a difference it makes. <laughs> So at first like, it was mild, is that right? It was like mild and more savory, I'd say. Like it tasted really good. And then that spice, it, it really hit after 15 or 10 or 15 minutes. And that's the great thing about doing these like hands-on farmer's experiences is that, you know, it's like not only do you get to harvest it, but then you, you get to learn all the tricks and the, the tips and tricks about how to uh, properly enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, interesting. And the comparison between the artificial wasabi and the real, the natural? Can you describe that? That was great. Well, unfortunately, it, it, it did. I, I always knew that the stuff we're getting from the tube was uh, imitation or fake. But when you do it side by side, mm, you, will, you will not think of the stuff in the tube as wasabi. <laughs> Just, uh, and si simply put, you know, that, that, the, the stuff in the tube, it, it has like a massive kick in like a very short period that like punches you in the face here. But the natural wasabi, it has like a really kind of a build up of spice and then a low, slow letdown and a really, really rich, savory, earthy flavor. So it tastes great and then the spiciness doesn't hit you. It's just like, mmm, whoa, that's spicy, wow. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just so much better. It's so much yeah. better. <laughs> I'd love to try that. And then you had a chance to mix with shoyu and to mix it with miso and to try yeah. on different local vegetables. What a great idea. Yeah, a nice, little nice tasting session too. We gotta yeah. take home that bottle. That was fun. <laughs> yeah, how fun. So mixed with shoyu, and then you can take that around when you're doing your fishing trip and try some, right? I used it for sashimi. It was really good. Wow, great. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think when uh, your customers come, what is the biggest appeal? Is it more food focused or is it more experience focused? Or is it a combination of different experiences that your customers are really looking for? Well, it's, def it's definitely a combination of, the, of many different types of experiences that all falls under, you know, the theme of the local. You know, you're, you're, you're experiencing the countryside in a way that you know you would never be able to experience if you're just to, if you're just to come here on your own, and you're coming here with a you know a local group like us and. 
you know, we're introducing to, to locals here who love foreigners, love international tourists, and they want to, they're, they're, you know, the people we work with are themselves, they're, they're grateful that people choose to spend their, you know, short holidays to come out to their area to learn about their culture. So when customers come here, they really feel welcome here. They really feel like, um, you know, they feel, they, 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 a lot of friends, they, a lot of my customers, they tell me, you know, it feels like, it feels like, you know, our guides, like, I'm, it feels like I'm their friend that they've known for a while that's showing them around this area that they live and, you know, they really feel like they're getting welcome here. They really, they're meeting a lot of people, making a lot of uh, personal friends, you know, staying in a farmer's homestay in a farmer's house and then going out to the farm with the farmers at 4 a.m. in the morning and spending the whole day with them, and eating together. You know, you, you, you become friends with them. You're having a great time. You're learning a lot. You know, it's, it's the personal experiences. It's the hands-on experiences. It's the really, really authentic and local experiences that make it. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Lauren says, yes, it is the people, the people that make the experience. That's for sure. And finding that connection to local people is something that you really need a, a local guide like you guys um, to help out with, even if it's self-catered, right? Like you guys can still help make the bookings. You can help uh, book the experiences. You can give them personalized recommendations. Sure. Um, not just guide with a, a person along the way, but you can help people plan their trip, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, and we do some self-guided programs as well. And, you know, um, another thing that we do to help make it possible for locals here to be able to accept, accept groups that don't have a guide is that a lot of people here in Yamagata, a lot, when I say a lot, I mean a whole lot, they really would love to bring welcome international guests into their restaurants. And a lot of chefs, they come up to you and says, oh, you know, I saw, I saw what you do with the chef Suda. He says, oh, can we do something? They want, they want it. They want to welcome the international people. It's fun for them. It's new for them. But they just don't know how. Like they can't, you know, a lot of people, they, they have very limited English or some can't speak English. And so we think, okay, so if, you're, if we're going to design an experience with you where, you know, we can't, where you can't speak English, then maybe, for example, we make a, 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 a detailed handout that has like one, to, like one to 15 and then the chef will just say, okay, number one. And as he's talking, you can, you can read exactly what he's saying. There's, there's, there's ways to get around it, to get around the language barrier or the cultural barrier. We just have to prepare them. And so preparing, preparing the Japanese local people and also preparing the local people so, they, so both sides know exactly what to expect when they meet each other and to make sure that process goes smoothly. Yeah. That's so important. It's educating the consumer, but it's also educating the businesses. Um, how many times have I told people, and I'm sure you as well, that it doesn't really matter if you can speak English or not. It's the, the kimochi, the showing that you are welcoming them. Even if you're only speaking Japanese, the visitor can feel that. They can understand yeah. that, right? So it's mm -hmm. not a linguistic problem. The linguistic problem is easy to fix, right? Haven't you found? Mm -hmm. But if you have okay. willing local companies who want to accept, that's your point of appeal, right? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. We have, and we have, um, I'm sure Anne can attest to that when she was here, we have no shortage of local people, or no, no shortage of welcome in this area. I think um, one comment I could make about this region, it, it's like it's like how it's, it's like how Japan was uh, like 10 years ago, you know, just or 10 or even 15 years ago when, you know, even in Tokyo, people, they'd be, they'd be like, oh my gosh, you, you, you wanted to come to Japan, you wanted to see our culture, well, thank, thank you, and they say, well, gosh, is there anything I can do to make this person comfortable? Since then, Tokyo has been inundated with customers, and, you know, it's just difficult for them to present that same level of omotenashi or kindness but here in Yamagata it's still the same like um, we had a we had the cruise ships come to this area um, we got like four a year and um, when the cruise ships come in we have all the local people come out to go welcome them waving the flags and because like, a lot of people here they've never seen they've never seen or never really talked to an international person before so you know, when international people come they, they think they think of it like oh my gosh how look at all these people coming to our area and, it, and, that, and that, that sense of welcome, that welcomeness, it makes a big difference because the MSC cruise ship that holds 4,000 people, it stopped at maybe 20 or so, so, so ports around Japan, including the major ports. But on their customer surveys, the number one the port they loved was the port of Sakata here in Yamagata. And the reason why, 
because they felt welcome. Every shop, they felt welcome on the buses, on the taxis, in the restaurants. They they felt like that people wanted them here. And like you said, the they can't the people here probably had the lowest level of English ability of all the ports, but didn't matter. Yeah, the, the kindness to、yeah. to overcome that and to to show with actions, not just、yeah. with words, right? Like it's it's so much about. Uh, I love that about Japanese culture, about Japanese culture of hospitality.、Uh, when you sit down, somebody will just give you a cup of tea. You might not have ordered it, you didn't ask for it, but it's that it's a omotenashi. I know we we have problems with that in terms of hospitality sometimes, but if it comes from a feeling of wanting to take care of people, I think that can definitely be understood by the customer and definitely appreciated. Uh, let's、mm-hmm. talk a little bit about somaro because I think、mm-hmm. unique for rural areas to have、uh, micro tea house or micro performance. Uh huh. Okay. So somaro micro tea house. I used to be there.、Um, I used to do their photography, and I used to. I worked in the company that owned them, so then I was helping them、uh, get more international tours and whatnot. But、um, yeah, the history of somaro dates back to the Edo period because the. Oh, I have to go a little bit. I have to go a little bit wider. Okay, so Yamagata Prefecture it was one of the main rice-producing regions of, of Japan because when the capital moved from Kyoto to Edo,、um, you know Edo didn't have the food production area、uh, set up around it, so it desperately needed a huge influx of rice. And so Yamagata was one of the regions that was designated by the government to produce that rice. And so all that rice was carried by the rivers to the port of Sakata, and then was shipped off, you know, to Edo. And so, because and as and because of that, basically the port city flourished. It got really, really big, really, really fast. And so, you needed an entertainment district for the officials and merchants that came through that city. And some of that geisha culture from southern Japan came up on the ships, and it took root in the form of samado in the Edo period. And、um, so that's the reason why we have my,、uh, geisha culture in northern Japan, which is not native to the area. But the reason why it was able to continue so long is because the local people they invested lots of money to maintain that micro training association to restore the building. And、um, so, getting back to the Edo, Edo period, you have the same you have the same facility and the same、uh, so、you have the same practices that have continued for hundreds of years. And so, if you go to Somado.、Um, What's unique about Somado? Why I really try to push the customers is that you know you can see the micro performance right in front of you, and it only costs like twenty four, twenty five dollars to see it. Soup is too cheap, way too cheap for the level of performance you can see, for the for the ex- the elegance that the micro dance with, for the the, the expertise of the the senior uh, micro, uh, senior uh, geisha who teaches them, and you could do private lunches there for like fifty or sixty dollars. It's 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 too cheap, and. You know, if you can get right up close and personal, you can talk with the micro too. In Kyoto or other cities, you'd be hard pressed to find something like that. Yeah, that's a really unique experience. I think really hard to to find other areas. Like I even I visited Kyoto a few weeks ago,、um, and it's not like a usual experience. It's very hard to. Engage with Michael, even to catch them walking down the street. Although you see that on the internet all the time, there's special rules because they don't want to be hassled as they're walking down the street.、Um, but to have a performance, so you're you're a paid customer,、yeah. you are supporting them.、Uh, you're not just snapping a picture as they walk by, and you have that chance to see them dance and to really feel the the history and heritage. I think it's really special. And you can even do.、Um, we're talking about doing some more deeper experiences with them. So you can you can even do the traditional micro games together with the micro.、Uh, it's hard to explain, but you can interact. You can really interact with them on a、uh, more personal basis here. Wow, wonderful. Well, we've got only five more minutes.、Uh, is there anything you're planning as we go into the new year? Are things that you are trans- transitioning online because of? Coronavirus, or are you planning for after coronavirus? What are your thoughts、yeah. right now? Yeah, we're we're mostly just focusing on creating new experiences. We recently got our travel license,、uh, like I said earlier. So, you know, we're 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 shifting from you know three or four hour experiences into overnight, you know, multiple day packages, and just working with more and more local people. I think more now now more than ever. You know, people are looking looking for the economic tourist boom after after coronavirus because they need it. 
So I'm working. With, I'm just meeting every day. Every day we're meeting with new local people. Like today, I'm going to go out and meet like four or five different vendors, talking about what we can do with them. So just focusing on making new experiences, new tour packages for when, you know, hopefully half a year from now, once maybe Japan reopens. Just we're just focusing on that time right now. That's good. Is there any advice you're giving local vendors right now? Like. Um, one of the things that I did in、uh, consulting recently is I said try to create your branding. Think of this as a good time for branding. Get your、uh, presence on social media. Is this something that you can help local vendors with? Yeah, I mean,、um, well, we, to go even more basic than that, we just have to create English signage in restaurants and. I, I'm doing basic, basic, basic Ikaiwa English lessons for, for example, we're doing, we're making, we're setting up cycling tours in Yamagata, and to do safe cycling tours, you have to know a certain level of English. You have to know certain words like stop, right turn. You have to know key words in order to instruct people about safety on a, on a moment's notice. So I'm doing English lessons like that.、Um, yeah, branding wise, we're working on a couple of projects. We're working with the local cities and the prefecture, and also. Uh, some government projects as well to do branding in Yamagata, because、um, well, for example, the、uh, in Suzuka City it has a、uh, UNESCO designation as a creative city of gastronomy. You have tons of heirloom crops that have such a very very rich deep history. So、um, before we did work to help you know build up that brand, and currently we're trying to make we're, we're working with Suzuka City to make UNESCO food tour branded programs that are recognized by、uh, the city there and and made. In collaboration with the local farmers in the city, really just to help create up that value, you know, really、uh, cert- and then really gather up that that the history and the story in a presentable manner under that package, under that brand package. I think there's so much available for people who visit your area. We're talking huge, beautiful nature and outdoor experiences. Really interesting interaction with local businesses. There's so much on offer.、Um, you're doing such a great job. Thank you so much. No, thank you, thank you, <laughs> and thank you for having me. And I'm really, I'm always happy to talk about it. And I have a personal passion for pulling this region. Like,、uh, I, I take I take a lot of joy、um, from being able to welcome guests here and in, 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 introducing the locals.、Uh, I'll say one last thing is that when I was an English teacher. Uh, the reason why I left after a year, even though I love kids and I wanted to do it for at least three years, is just the students had no will to study English. They had no interest in international anything. And I talked to them, and they said, "Well, I'm going to be a farmer. So why do I need to know that?" And then I, in the elementary school, I go to little kids and say, "Have you ever met an international person?" And maybe have one or two kids in the class of twenty that raise their hand. So of course they're not interested in international. Uh, matters. Of course, I'm not interested in English because they've never even interacted with international people. It's、uh, it's a big disadvantage that this region has, and I think that if we can build a foreign tourism here, we can help change that. We can help create a reason for people to learn English, and we can help create jobs here that will actually use English. Because、uh, other than inbound tourism, th- there's no need for English in this area. There's no motivation to study. It's gonna it's gonna hurt this region in the long term. So we gotta change that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I was a teacher as well for many years, and、um, finding the reason, the motivation for students to learn English and to find a reason to learn how to communicate, and providing that through tourism and bringing tourists in, you can have a great knock-on effect on the education, on businesses, on so many. Things around the region—it's like destination branding. What you're doing—it's not just your travel business. It's not just the businesses you interact with. It's creating appeal for the entire area, as well as motivating students and locals to learn English and be more interested in international travel as well. So wonderful, great credit you're doing for the whole area. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> And always happy to see your channel. You're introducing all these local people that、oh, have the、wonderful. same mission as us. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think my passion growing up in Hawaii has always been to find a way to balance the needs of locals with visitors because Hawaii has over tourism issues. Japan, Kyoto, certain areas have over tourism issues. Not enough in the rural areas. So it's a, such a wonderful way during this series to talk to people like you from around Japan who are doing such interesting things. Outside of the big cities, you know, to create that appeal, which is so important. 
and then I'll, I'd like to end on one note too off of those comments is that you know if you're if you're thinking about if you want to make that if you want to support the areas where you travel if you want to be a respectful traveler and really leave the area better off than when you when than when than when you uh, were before uh, traveling to rural Japan traveling out off the more further you get off the beaten path the more benefit that your that your presence and that your your spending is going to have for the local people here because if you go to Tokyo Kyoto Osaka you spend you stay in a hotel you read a restaurant it's just a drop in the ocean for them but in like Yamagata and the small villages your presence there um, it, it creates it, you know it has it, it has much more noticeable economic impact and it also inspires people people will start to see you and you know they're, they're going to be inspired they're going to be encouraged saying well I guess international tourists really do want to see our region and that really gets them more excited so uh, I do hope that your viewers, I hope people watching here will consider, you know, putting in that little bit of extra effort to uh, go off the beaten path and get a more personal experience. And stay longer. Don't rush. Stay, stay and longer. enjoy. Stay local. And, yeah. you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to travel to a new hotel every night. You can stay at the same hotel and you can, you can really get deeper into that area. Yeah. I know a lot of um, people, when they, before they come to Japan, it looks like it's easy to get around. You can use the rail pass, go from here and there. Um, but you're kind of cheating yourself, I think, as well as cheating the local area. So if you plan to just stay in areas a bit longer, two nights minimum, I would say, it's a better, better service for your own experience as well as local areas. Thank you so much, Derek. Thank you, Jordan. And thank you for everyone for watching. Yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, tomorrow morning, we're talking 9 a.m. with a Japanese chef of home cooking who's based in Melbourne. And she's doing online Japanese cuisine uh, lessons. So that'll be interesting, talking about home cooking Japanese style tomorrow. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. See you around. Bye, Derek. Thanks. Bye.